good afternoon. Welcome to those of you who are still arriving. Thank you for joining me on this <laughs> lovely day in State College. I know some of you are um, in different states right now and I bet your weather's probably a little bit nicer than ours, but we welcome the rain. I'm gonna jump right in. Hello and welcome to Foundations for the Expressive Classical Singer. My name is Katherine Brady and I am a second year master's student studying voice performance and pedagogy at the Penn State School of Music. Thank you for joining me today for this virtual webinar. I would especially like to acknowledge those of you who are tuning in from various time zones and devoting part of your Sunday to a little bit of academic enrichment. This lecture recital will serve as a guide to help singers understand how to integrate emotional and expressive work into their vocal training. I will draw inspiration from practices in the acting world while maintaining a strong consideration for the unique expectations and needs of today's classical singer. I believe that both technique and expression are important and that they should be equally trained and fostered throughout a singer's development. This topic was inspired by my experience as a developing classical singer. I came into my undergraduate studies with a wealth of experience in straight acting, varied performance styles, and musical theater, but I had barely any classical technical training. As my technical skills have grown, I have been fortunate to be able to lean on my existing foundation of expressive skills to help me bring my art music to life. But my situation is not universal. The opportunities to develop such a foundation are not always available to the classical student, and this often results in singers struggling to produce consistently engaging performances because of their lack of expressive skill training. The learning process for classical singers, especially in America, is staggering. We are expected to master a multitude of skills and apply them to an art form that for many can feel incredibly foreign. It is easy for young singers to get entangled in the complexities and lose sight of why they are singing in the first place. At the end of the day, music is an art form. It needs to say something. It needs to express something. There is a stereotype of the classical singer who performs in a stoic posture with their hands clasped in front and no emotional connection to the music whatsoever. Their primary focus is producing a technically perfect and sonically beautiful sound. This archetype can also be described as wooden or inaccessible because the singer has allowed the technical mind to take over, shortchanging the time spent stretching their muscles as expressive beings. While technique is essential, it should not become the sole focus of the classical singer. I will discuss how singers can bridge the gap between technique and expression and how these elements should be treated like collaborators and not antagonists. I turned to experienced di directors, teachers, and coaches as I dove into this topic. Some published quotations existed, but I also found it immensely helpful to go right to the source and interview a collection of working professionals. These interviews helped shed light on effective practices and some areas where developing singers are missing key foundational expressive skills. Now, it might be tempting for me to take this opportunity to lay out a prescribed regimen of particular acting classes or techniques and tout them as the ultimate guide for training expressive singers, <laughs> but this would be of no use. Viola Spolin observes that, quote, theater techniques are far from sacred. The actuality of the communication is far more important than the method used, end quote. Therefore, I have chosen to simply highlight a few areas and explain why I think they would make a useful addition to a singer's learning experience. It is important to acknowledge that each person has an individual learning style and every performer is a work in progress. I am also not advocating that voice teachers attempt to integrate every possible discipline into their studio work. Such a demand would be unreasonable and ineffective. 
As Mary Saunders Barton and Norman Spivey say in their book, Cross Training in the Voice Studio, quote, no teacher is an island, although we sometimes feel that way. We cannot do it all, and we shouldn't try, end quote. This presentation is simply an opportunity to consider some additional resources which would be beneficial to the developing singer. I encourage singers and teachers alike to proceed with an open mind and a willingness to try something new because often the best way to learn is to jump right in. There are many teachers who have developed respected practices of voice and speech training. It may seem counterintuitive for a singer to treat, seek training with their speaking voice, but these practices go beyond elocution and often provide an opportunity for an individual to get more in touch with themselves. Voice and speech teacher Kristen Linklater emphasizes that blocked emotions are the fundamental obstacle to a free voice and muddy thinking is the fundamental obstacle to clear articulation. Her type of voice work is designed to liberate the voice by means of clear thinking and free emotional expression. Voice and speech training has evolved throughout its history. A person without recent experience in this area may imagine a scene in My Fair Lady with poor Eliza attempting to speak with a mouthful of marbles. This type of methodology may have been common practice in the past, but the area of speech training has been developed by numerous teachers into practices which now blur the line between acting and technical voice production. There is commonly an emphasis on the importance of an actor's groundedness, healthy alignment, strength, dexterity, stamina, physical freedom, and an expansive range of expressiveness. Voice, movement, and acting instruction are recognized as fundamental to the actor's process. I have had some introductory experience with Fitzmorris voice work, a practice developed by Catherine Fitzmorris. Much of my experience involved physical release and a, an attentive connection of myself to my surroundings. This physical and attentive work helped me clue into myself and it felt like the dust in my mind began to settle. Once I had the opportunity to actually speak a text, there was no need for me to plan any dramatic journey or craft a backstory. I simply opened my mouth and allowed the emotions to pour out. It was not anything I could have anticipated, but I found deeper access to authentic expression through this type of work. I will not attempt to explain or summarize Fitzmorris voice work nor any other voice and speech technique because one needs to experience the work in order to understand it. Voice and speech work is an opportunity to get in touch with what you are experiencing and develop a language for it. Acting training encompasses many facets of a person. Much of today's training engages the actor's total being, physical, vocal, emotional, and psychological. There is an essential connection between the body and the mind that should be considered. The mind is embodied. Not only must the mind work within a living body, but the ways we think, our sense of self, and the foundational concepts we use to perceive the world and other people in it derive from the embeddedness of our bodies on planet Earth. Our minds do not float above the messiness of material reality. Voice and speech work is an opportunity for a performer to better understand their connection to their body and access natural and authentic vocal expression. It is in the process of voice and speech work that a performer can strip down their voice to its natural core without the added influence of any expectations or aesthetic standards. This type of vocal foundation can be incredibly helpful for a singer of any style, especially a style as elite and complex as classical singing. Another area that is often underexplored by classical singers is movement. Movement can be explored through a number of avenues, including dance, stage combat, Alexander technique, mime, mask, 
<laughs> yoga, and more. There are some obvious applications of such training. For example, if one is hoping to play Mercutio in Romeo and Juliet, it is important to have some practice at sword fighting. It would also be helpful for another performer to practice the waltz before starting rehearsals for Die Fledermaus. But movement goes beyond task-specific skills. It is an integral part of the singer-actor's experience. The mind and the body are intertwined and inseparable in the operations of empathy, emotion, and conceptual blending. Opera director Noah Namat believes that the audience should be able to perceive several details about the status, personality, or mood of a particular character before they hear a note. This can be achieved by the performer through body language and movement. In a visual dramatic art form like classical singing, the body cannot be neglected. Jonathan K. Becker says, through the training of the body, an instrument of communication is created. The physical presence of the actor communicates to an audience everything there is to know about the character being portrayed at a particular moment. The very physical presence of the actor begins a conversation with the audience. Through physical exploration, a person can develop a fluency with communication beyond vocal production. Physical work helps the performer feel more comfortable on stage and ready to embody a full character. Character embodiment involves important components like age, time period, activity, social class, and personality. It is not enough to simply know these details. A singer must be able to infuse them into physical storytelling. A timid orphan will move and carry the body in a completely different way than an arrogant aristocrat. Mask work is a helpful tool for performers to practice physical expression without the use of face or voice. When actors cover their faces with a mask, they are completely dependent on communicating through movement and thereby develop their physical communication skills. Gesture is deeply connected to communication. Try looking in a mirror and use speech to describe something round or a person moving quickly and observe the natural gestures of your arms. Gesture was how our ancestors communicated before verbal speech and it is deeply ingrained in our natural communication. Take the example of waving to say hello to a friend. Hello! The natural pattern is that your arm will begin to wave before you speak the word hello. As a comparison, you can try the opposite action and begin to speak before the arm moves. Hello! It is likely that the latter order of actions will feel strange and disjointed. That's an activity I picked up from Candace Evans. Physical training gives a student a chance to develop their proprioception. Proprioception is an innate sense of positioning of one's own body. A singer can greatly benefit from this innate sense of positioning, both from an expressive and a technical standpoint. A singer with developed proprioception can convincingly portray a mechanical doll on stage and can also feel the muscular movement of her abdomen, which supports her breath. Keep in mind that a singer's instrument is their body. A better understanding and awareness of one's instrument can be incredibly beneficial when attempting to develop an elite skill like classical singing. When singers take the time to check in with their bodies, they are better equipped to release extraneous tension and use the body effectively. It is easy for a singer to become hyper-focused on a concept or technical task. There are practices like Alexander Technique, which can directly manage such issues. Concentration is often associated with a state of over-tension, manifested by a furrowed brow and an interference with breathing, almost as though one were trying to hold everything in place so as to be able to focus totally on a certain aspect of one's surroundings. Attention in the Alexandrian sense involves a balanced awareness of oneself and one's surroundings with an easy emphasis on whatever is particularly relevant at the moment. Activities like dance and yoga can help a singer gain a sense of agency 
over their body. It is important for an expressive performer to feel confident in the use of their body and be ready to collapse, move quickly, or do whatever the dramatic moment demands without hesitation. I encourage singers to find some movement training that works for them and resonates with their individual goals. Most acting training begins with exploration and play. It is important for developing actors to explore their expressive skills without a particular script or production in mind. A great tool for the developing actor is improvisation. At the same time as actors are working toward fully embodied characterizations, they are also attempting to read the emotions of the other actor slash characters with whom they are improvising. Improvisations, whether in a class or in rehearsals for a production, prove a unique opportunity to explore emotion. There are two basic steps to creating an improvisation. First, set up a situation, and then behave as if you are in it. This may seem like a straightforward task, but in reality, it can be quite daunting, especially if you have never done it before. Performers need to have the opportunity to experiment and stretch their legs with improv games and activities. Improvisations can be done silently, spoken, or even sung. In a class or workshop, performers can interact in pairs, small groups, or large ensembles and bring their improvised worlds to life. Anyone who has performed in a chorus knows the value of being able to create a character and interact with their castmates without any specific instruction from the script or libretto, this skill is not something that comes easily to everyone. And imagine how much more interesting a production would be if all of the performers had experience and confidence with improvisation. Through the practice of improvisation, a performer develops empathy and conceptual integration. Lynn Helding describes empathy as one of our greatest evolutionary gifts, which allows us to step outside ourselves and enter the soul of another. Not only is empathy an important quality in a singer, but it is one of the foundational tenets of the performing arts as a whole. An audience attends a performance to feel and experience emotions. Without empathy, the audience cannot invest in the story and they walk away having simply spent some time watching people on stage. In a similar way, a performer who does not empathize with their character walks away having simply spent some time moving around and making noise. Bruce McConaughey says, when an actor plays a character, she is able to blend a concept of herself with a concept of the character to be played. This is known as conceptual integration and it is essential for any type of dramatic performance. Many theater games and improvisation exercises are designed to get a performer to begin to develop their conceptual integration skills. A distinctive characteristic which separates the training of singers and that of actors is the idea of Individualization versus collaboration. A singer's training is incredibly individualized. Aside from singing in a chorus, the majority of a singer's training is spent in one-on-one -on -one lessons, individual coachings, and solitary hours in the practice room. Even when a singer is performing in an operatic production, they spend months individually preparing their role before they step foot into a rehearsal with another cast member. Group settings like diction courses or master classes are structured around developing one's individual work, and there is no need for artistic interaction beyond teacher and student. This focus on the individual can be isolating and skews the psyche of the singer to become self-absorbed and does not leave much room for flexibility. Conversely, an actor's training is infused with collaboration Acting classes commonly incorporate group interaction and multi-person multi scenes are more common than monologues. Actors approach their involvement in a scene based on the characters around them 
and bring the action alive by responding to their circumstances. There is an old adage that acting is reacting. One of the most effective ways to learn about and practice reacting is to interact with other actors in games, activities, and improvisational exercises. These types of training tools are foundational for developing an actor's sense of inhabiting the present while adapting to changes in real time. Actors commonly continue to participate in group classes and training even as working professionals. The ability to collaborate and adjust to varying changes is especially relevant for classical singers. An opera singer must be able to retain their technical skills while adjusting to the demands of a particular production. Oftentimes, singers will repeat the same role many times in their careers. The same singer may perform the role of Carmen in five different productions with five different directors in five different settings under the baton of five different conductors. Even when the same role is not repeated, the classical singer is constantly moving around and performing with different organizations on different projects. It is simply the nature of the job. That singer needs to be ready to jump into each new situation with an open mind and flexibility while maintaining a steady grasp on their unique technical demands. This skill set is not something that always comes naturally, especially when a singer spends so much of their time in an individualized situation. Therefore, collaboration is another skill that should be integrated and practiced throughout a singer's development. In classical vocal training, there are numerous demands placed on the singer. One has to gain a proficiency in a variety of areas, such as music theory, history, sight singing, multiple languages, diction, vocal technique, and stylistic standards. With so many disciplines to master, the singing musician often falls into a mindset of right slash wrong. We can all hear it now. That interval needs to be a perfect fourth, not a perfect fifth. The French schwa pronunciation is not the same as the German. This is the correct type of ornamentation for a Baroque aria. Do not breathe in the middle of a phrase, or even worse, a word. <laughs> the list goes on and on. Our young singers are tasked with meeting towering demands which lie within predetermined parameters. Faced with these challenges, it is logical for one to adopt an analytical mindset. While analytical thinking can be quite beneficial, all too often the singer slips into a singular mindset of right slash wrong. When the artist's main goal is to do the right thing and avoid being chastised for doing the wrong thing, they inevitably end up building an emotional wall and no longer feel free to play and experiment. It is difficult for them to infuse their piece with emotion or storytelling because they have been conditioned to think only in terms of right and wrong. This mindset is not helpful, nor is it healthy for the young singer. There is no more room for spontaneity and exploration. The singer has inadvertently cut off their emotional self because their study has been overwhelmed by black and white standards. However, When the singer has a chance to explore their expressive skills from the beginning of their training, they can bring their open and explorative attitude and integrate it into their technical and analytical work. For example, a piece of music may indicate a subito piano dynamic mark. A purely analytical approach could produce that dynamic shift. It could be done in a simple vocalese. The analytical singer may also know that the music gets soft at this point because the singer is sad and they could produce a sad sounding tone. However, when a 
singer is encouraged and given the opportunity to explore different possibilities and really think about why they might be having this dynamic shift, it could produce some different options. Perhaps I am getting soft right there because I notice something and I think that somebody has heard me and I don't want to be overheard. Oh. Or maybe I want to consider why was I loud in the first place? Maybe I'm really excited about something and then when the dynamic shifts to soft, I have a moment of doubt. <laughs> this type of play allows a student to start investing in their art and allowing the music to truly come from them and their choices. It gives them a sense of agency it also can produce an arguably more engaging and musically expressive performance. And it doesn't hurt that it gives you a little bit of a distraction from your technique for a moment. A great way to get your students to loosen up and for you to get yourself to loosen up as a singer is to integrate an, an idea of curiosity and play. We're going to try a little exercise. Vocal coach and vaults developed a set of attitude cards that have different ideas for attitudes, moods that one could have during a song. So we're going to use the example of Go Lovely Rose by Roger Quilter. And I've taken the liberty of pre-selecting a few words that would be appropriate for this song and I've randomly mixed them up and I'm going to go through the song and apply these different attitudes to the first section. Let's just give it a shot. This type of work can help the student feel uh, free from trying to come up with everything, it kind of lays it out for them a little bit, and it gives them a chance to find some of the nuance in their piece. A song like this could be easily interpreted as just a love song, one color throughout the whole thing, but it really is never that. All of these words were similar, but they had their own unique sort of color to them and that's worth exploring and discovering in your own music. Now, in a slightly different way, still using the attitude cards, I selected some random attitudes that may not be appropriate for the song, or they may be, um, and sort of mixed those up. And let's see what happens when we apply some of those to this song. Domineering. <laughs>
one of my favorite ways to play with uh, a piece. And um, it gives a sense of play to your work. It frees up the body and the face to use natural expressions and gestures without having to pre-plan what am I going to do when. You can rely on that foundational experience you've had working on your voice and speech training and your movement training to allow the natural gestures of the moment to come through. You are again stepping out of your analytical mind and you can trust the technique that you've developed up until that point and allow the artistry to come through. It also can open up new physical technical possibilities. Uh, <laughs> did you notice in a difference in the timbre when I was singing in the first set versus the second set? Maybe some amped up um, emotions can help make the sound darker or open it up more or engage the breath in a different way. I will share an example about a production that I did once of an opera where my character had to have a disguised voice at one point. And so I played around with different sort of silly ways to do my voice, but still singing operatically, but with sort of a silly voice. And my voice teacher at the time um, <laughs> made the observation that when I did this silly voice, it actually helped unlock some technical issue that he and I had been working on, um, but had it had never really gotten to click yet and for some reason me doing this silly voice just helped free up my vocal mechanism in a new way that I was able to apply to my singing that wasn't in the silly voice anymore. And so I invite you to be open and see what may come forth when you incorporate play into your work. All right, we're gonna try another exercise. This one deals with improvisation and character building. So I have some jars here with different ideas for um, elements to create these characters and these scenes. It'll all make sense. I'll be using a piece of music from the opera Carmen by Georges Bizet, but there will be no lyrics. It's just la la la. And um, I'll be playing some random characters in it. So my first character, we're going to figure out her age. She's 16. A 16 year old whose personality is anxious. An anxious 16 year old. So I would start thinking about how might a 16 year old carry themselves. I was 16 once. I worked with 16 year olds. I might be able to take some of that observation into this. Also being anxious can draw from my own life experience, also from observing how other people move, what might an anxious person do. Now, my third piece of the puzzle is my scene partner. So my scene partner is my enemy. So I am an anxious 16 year old who is talking to her enemy. Uh, let's jump into it. Let's try another one and then we'll talk about it a little bit. So my next character is aged 31 and her personality, 31 years old, personality is boisterous, a boisterous 31 year old and my scene partner is a small child. Ooh, I'm a boisterous 31 year old interacting with a small child.
type of work um, you may have observed I was able to incorporate some more physicality in what I was doing. Were you able to interpret some things about my character based off of how they were carrying themselves? Could you tell a little bit about what might have been happening in the imaginary scene I had in my head? It gives you a chance to um, try things out, react in the moment. You could do this type of work with a scene partner too. Another element to think about as a classical singer is the element of a foreign language. Especially in the United States, when we view opera, a lot of our audience doesn't know the language because it'll be often in Italian, German, or French. And um, even when they have translations, it's not their vernacular. And so classical singers are tasked with being able to communicate to the audience even more so without the use of language and the specifics of it because we know they don't necessarily understand it all. We need to be able to communicate through our vocal color, our expression, and um, our gestures. Speaking of foreign language, we're going to look at an aria. This aria is in Italian and it is from Le Nozze di Figaro by Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. The Marriage of Figaro by Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. And the aria is Voi Che Sapete. Now, let's talk about this opera a little bit and this character. Um, we would want to spend a lot of time with the Italian language and understand what's going on, who's in the scenes. And so my character is Cherubino. He is a pubescent um, teenager, and that is right. <laughs> you caught it right. I said he. It, if you're not a common opera goer, you may not realize this, but it's actually uh, a pretty normal thing for women to play younger, young boys or early pubescent boys. So I like to think of Cherubino as 13, and he's a page. So he's in the nobility. We're in the late 18th century Spain, and he's sort of coming up into his nobleness and his manhood, but he's also 13, and he's got all the puberty stuff going on at the same time. Now, the situation we've got going on here is that he wrote a love song for his crush, the Countess. And he has found himself now in a situation where he is in the Countess's bedroom, very scandalous, um, along with Susanna, who is another woman in the story who has sort of convinced him, pushed him in a corner a little bit, to perform his love song that he wrote for the Countess, for the Countess, in her room, right then. Um, and she offers to accompany him. It's just, um, he's, he's stuck. And so the situation is exciting for him, but it's also, you know, high stakes because he could get caught. This is really not appropriate. Uh, he also wants to prove to the Countess that he is, he's a man now, you know, and he should be taken seriously. And his uh, expressions of love uh, are worth hearing and not just being excused as, oh, that cute little, little kid, right? And so I've taken time to work with the language and understand sort of the specifics of the way that Italian flows. I know the direct translation of each word. I know the general translation. I have an idea of some of the subtext. All of these things I'm listing off are sort of the analytical side of classical singing, which I repeat, is necessary. Um, Coach um, Wilson Sutherland recently used this example in one of our coachings that there's a recipe and there's a dish, right? When you go to a restaurant and you enjoy a delicious dish, you just enjoy the dish for what it is, but you don't think about what the recipe was. There's a, definitely is a recipe that the chef used, whether it's in their head or written down, but there's, you know, exact uh, proportions, ingredients, where they come from, how are they put together. And so this is the analytical part that we put together. But at the end of the day, we as performers need to serve a dish for the audience to enjoy and not be thinking about all those details.
I just share them with you now since we're talking about all the nitty gritty. So let's jump into this. Voike Sapete, he's in this awkward situation. He wants to woo the countess. He also has Susanna there who pressured him into this moment. Um, how will it all turn out? We shall see. We get to experience a little bit of the full product of doing an aria. Now let's talk about how we integrate these skill sets. I do not want to belittle the role that technique plays in a singer's development. Technique is critical for effective vocal production. To quote the voice pedagogue, Richard Miller, quote, even if you have the world's greatest imagination, nobody's going to know it if the instrument is in bad shape, end quote. I want to encourage a healthy balance where the expressive and technical aspects of singing are integrated and used to help each other. Diction affects expression. Body movement affects breath emotion affects articulation. The concept of integration can be applied to many facets of a student's life. Voice professor Norman Spivey compares it to a liberal arts model. It is important for a student to learn different skills and be exposed to different experiences throughout their lives. These skills and experiences will invariably inform their music making and educators should provide a space where integration is encouraged. Voice professor and opera director Paul Hotteling promotes the mantra, never vocalize, always make music, to help his students integrate emotion into their technical training. He also prefers the term inspiration rather than inhalation, 
because it leads the singer to set the tone for the coming vocal line. Voice teachers will commonly direct a singer to prepare the vocal tract for the note, uh, for the first note of a phrase by describing inhalation with words like, breathe in the note. Hotterling's inspiration verbiage is consistent with this type of technical instruction, but it integrates the intention behind the note with the technical components. They work together to create an authentic and thoughtful onset of sound. A great analogy that came from vocal coach Cheryl Lynn Fielding is the idea that intention and beauty of delivery are two pedals of the same bicycle. They are both crucial and must work together in order to propel the singer forward. When a singer is engaged expressively, there is a clear distinction in the quality of the performance. A clear dramatic intention can lead to freedom in the body, engagement of natural reflexes, and less thought about technique, all features of an enjoyable performance. It is all too often that a lovely performance is overshadowed by a performer's sudden concern for an upcoming high note or particularly tricky melisma. This type of distraction can pull the audience completely out of the moment and detract from impressive efforts which follow it. When a singers perform, they are communicating a shared human experience. The poet, composer, and singer form a golden triangle of collaboration. Something inspired the poet to write the words, which then inspired the composer to set the music, and the singer takes the inspiration into a new manifestation where it can be shared with an audience. No singer should diminish their contribution in this important trifecta. It is the singer's job to bring their own singular viewpoint to a piece of music and act as an emotional mirror for the audience. The audience cannot read the performer's mind and they're not supposed to. But when a performer is fully committed to the expressive experience and not concerned with sounding perfect, the audience is free to take in the story through their own lens. Oberlin Conservatory's opera theater director, Jonathan Field, emphasizes that, quote, audiences come back for the individual work by a performer, end quote. People attend live theater to watch the performers. <laughs> That's why we continue to find value in reproducing the same operas, plays, and songs. Each person brings something new to the experience, which is worth experiencing. I'm also reminded of a point that director Linda Brovsky made, by saying that casting directors are desperate for singers who are not vanilla. When you walk into an audition room and are able to integrate a part of yourself and your unique creative gifts into your performance, the creative team behind the table lets out a sigh of relief and is excited to see what else you have to offer. Richard Miller says, I'm absolutely convinced that the whole purpose of technique is to free the imagination for musical, textual, and dramatic imaginative things. I don't believe that great singers stand up and think that they're placing the tone out of the top of their heads. They're not thinking about that. That's all behind them. It would be detrimental and a self-induced handicap to expect to throw acting as a final element in one's training or development of particular material. Take another skill, like diction. One cannot master the sounds of Italian simply by working on the song Caro Mio Ben with a voice teacher, even if performed impeccably. In order to develop proficiency, further steps in exploration are necessary. For example, you might try out additional repertoire with new text, take an Italian diction course, take a semester or two of the language, dive deeper into the nuances of speech patterns and inflection with a coach, maybe do a summer program or study abroad, learn the variances of different regional dialects, etc. Why wouldn't we give the same amount of attention to our expressive and dramatic development? It is something that develops over time and we should not expect to master it straight out of the gate. It is something that must begin early and continue to grow with the singer alongside life experience and musical skills. 
Performers are dependent on the learning process. Skills should be introduced and progressively developed in order to produce successful lasting results. Part of this necessity is connected to memory. I will reference Bruce McConaughey here. Quote, psychologists have defined several kinds of memory and many of these come into play as actors work through scoring possibilities during rehearsals. In terms of two broad categories of memory, actors aim to offload as much of their performance as they can from explicit onto implicit memory. Explicit memory takes conscious attention. Actors who must think, what's my next line? And where do I sit after I say this? Are struggling with explicit memory. In contrast, professional actors master techniques over the years that help them to rely on implicit, unconscious memory. They learn their lines quickly, link them with onstage movement of the character, and intertwine both with intentions and responses." End quote. A performer who has not had a chance to sit with a particular skill set may find themselves relying heavily on explicit memory to get through a performance. For example, if they have limited experience with embodying excitement, as their character demands, they may be preoccupied with manufacturing facial expressions during their performance. However, if they do have experience with embodying excitement, they can rely on their implicit memory and allow for a productive mental flow. A performer ought to start movement, acting, and dance training as soon as they realize that they are interested in being a singer. These skills will grow with them because they will always be a work in progress. That is the nature of art and of life. These are skills that can be developed. One cannot expect proficiency without any effort. When it comes to expressive ability, it might be easy to say that some have it and some don't. But I would argue that it is a skill set that can and should be developed. It is likely that some singers start out with some level of innate ability or aptitude, but we should make an effort to develop everyone's skills, regardless of what they have when they come in the door. Performers of all natural abilities should foster their expressive skills. It will only help them in the long run. Singers are uniquely poised to express emotion and meaning through their use of lyrics and physical expression. While technique is fundamental for the successful singer, I would argue that emotional understanding and exploration are paramount for true artistic expression. Intention is what separates a musician from a mere tone generator, and an integrative process fosters performances that are authentic and meaningful. Thank you for joining me during this lecture recital. It was an invigorating topic, and I was happy to dive into it. I would like to acknowledge my recital committee, Professor Trost, Professor Copeland, and Professor Humans. They have provided much needed support and advisement throughout my research and preparation, and I thank them sincerely. I would also like to thank all of my interviewees for sharing their time and expertise. We could have done a much longer lecture recital on all the topics we covered, and I'm so grateful to have gotten the chance to talk with you all. In this strange time when we can all feel so isolated, it was amazing to have the opportunity to meet and connect with such interesting and knowledgeable professionals. This entire project has helped rekindle my love and appreciation for the performing arts, and I am grateful to share that appreciation with all of you. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.